today we're going to be talking about the uh, precepts and hindrances, finding the balance of how these work in any kind of practice and in life of how these actually work for you. Now we, we talked about the importance of uh, the uh, dana, the sila, and now the bhavana. We talked about the dana was the generosity, the sila was the morality base of the five precepts, and this was uh, not to kill or harm living beings on purpose. The second precept was not to steal or not to take what is not freely given. The third precept was not to have wrong sexual activity. This meant causing any pain for yourself or another person or anyone else involved in the situation, uh, pain of mental or physical nature. And then not to lie, not to be involved with gossip, which is talking about someone who is not there and you don't know if it's true or not, repeating things, or to get involved with slander. This is the other part of this, uh, because slander is talking in a way that you are trying to divide these people from those people. We don't want to do that. And the last one of the precepts was not to become involved with recreational drugs or alcohol in any way, because your mind becomes blurred and you will break the other four precepts. So that's, we don't do that um, because it opens us up to a, a situation of trouble. We talked about how these, these precepts are just like uh, running a car uh, by uh, saying that the precepts are not supposed to be a threatening kind of lecture about morality. They're supposed to be a set of advice that the Buddha gave us for our, our lives running in a very happy and uh, healthy way in life. Just the way the car runs very well for you if you have all five fluids in it. If we keep all of the five precepts, then our lives should be happy and run very well too. Now the other side of the precepts we have what's called the hindrances. And the hindrances in the Pali are the Nivarana, and in the English means the hindrance or the barrier for you that happens in life that causes you uh, to have problems. And these, uh, the Buddha also laid out for us these, these hindrances and told us basically if we keep the precepts, these hindrances are not going to come up and they are not going to bother us in our lives. Now, unfortunately for us, a, a lot of times we hear the precepts taught in Sunday school a lot, but then we don't hear about the hindrances themselves until we get involved in meditation. But what I want to stress is the importance of teaching the precepts and the hindrances at the same time. And the reason for this is because if we break the precepts, that's what makes the hindrances come up. Now I'll give you an example. There were two people, two people uh, driving a car, uh, each different cars, and one man was just driving home from work, and he hit a turtle and killed it on the road. And he got home, he felt very sad about this, and he, the consequences of this for him were not too bad because he didn't mean to hit the turtle. He felt bad about it afterwards. But the consequences of this action, this karma which took place, was not very heavy for him because he didn't have the intention of killing this turtle. Then we have this other man who had an argument with somebody at work before he left. He was very angry, and on the way home, he got so mad he wanted to do something, he saw a turtle and he killed it. Well, he has a different problem, <laughs> because he had intention to kill something, and when he got home, it started to work internally on him because he felt bad about this hatred and ill will that he had inside of him when he killed the turtle. He felt bad because he felt guilty 
the guilt and remorse that he felt because he had done this act, and then he got restless, and he could even have had what we call sloth and torpor. Let's talk about what these, these hindrances are so that we understand what we're talking about to begin with. The hindrances are five. The first one is lust and greed. It is the attachment that we get involved in. These can be something that we really like, but we like to the extent that we think about it and we don't think about anything else. Lust and uh, greed, the I want it mind that leads to attachment, and we get preoccupied with it. See, it's really, really important to understand um, that um, we stay in the present moment in life as much as possible. This is where we are actually alive. Um, we are going to um, show you that on a slide a little bit later in another talk of the past and the future and this present moment. If you draw a line on a piece of paper, okay, and at one end you are born, and at the other end of the line, you die. And you're in a little tiny, a little tiny vehicle that goes along this line, and it's a perfect little vehicle that is fit just for you. It's like a little spaceship that you fit in perfectly. And you're moving along this line all your life. Now, what happens is inside that little spaceship that you're riding along in that little capsule, Everything's perfect because you're in the present moment and your energy is in the present moment and you're fully alive. And it interested me to find that in the Buddhist teaching he talks about the present is the place where you have the most power, the most clarity of your mind. But what it is that is the problem for us with the suffering we face is that we get caught up with the past and what happened in the past, those emotions are carried with us into the present moment, and they are very heavy. The, uh, the guilt, the remorse, the feeling sadness of past things or missing things that we really loved before, the things that change, those things that we miss, if we carry them into the present moment, our life gets very, very heavy. Now, in the future, in the future over here, in front of us, in front of the capsule, we're not there yet. And, but we still spend time in the present moment worrying about what might happen tomorrow, worrying about the future. I know in the United States right now, there's a great many people afraid of losing their houses of lo and losing their uh, property because of the economic problems that are happening in the world. And some people are getting, uh, you know, sick from the amount of worry about what might happen, what might happen, what could happen. But the Buddha is saying, if you understand this clearly, you wouldn't be so worried about this in the future, and you wouldn't be so worried about this in the past, because I've told you clearly how this works, and the present moment is where you should be putting all of your energy into the present moment, into whatever you are doing. So this is what we need to practice, you see. Now, with the hindrances, this I want it, this uh, I like it, I want it, and we get attached so much to it, we start thinking about it all the time, we're not here in the present moment. We're thinking about this all the time, and we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. So um, the second one is uh, hatred and aversion. The I don't like it, and I don't want it mind. And when we have this happening, the same problem exists. We get so consumed with it, we are outside of the present moment. Okay, the third one that we get to is sloth and torpor. Sloth and torpor can happen to this for the man who hit the turtle, and he did this on purpose, you know. He can end up at work being sloth and torpor, feeling sleepy at work, not being able to focus our mind, and just feeling like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. 
and having this come up in your mind all the time, this feeling bad about something that happened, this is sloth and torpor. Your energy drops away because the worry in your mind sucks away the energy from your body and your mind. So the sloth and torpor is really bad. And the next one is restlessness, guilt, and remorse. If we break our precepts, what happens is this restlessness, this guilt, and this remorse, it comes up and it can bite us. And then our minds go completely to this. We start thinking about what we did, what happened, and everything like this. And so we get consumed in that. And once again, we're not in the present moment. This present moment is precious to us. This present moment is important. And then the last one, the last, the fifth one of these, these are uh, hindrances is doubt. Now when we're involved in the meditation and we're practicing, it's doubt of how the meditation works. It throws us off and we get frustrated because we're not making what we feel is progress and we're not progressing along at a good pace. We start to feel, well, am I doing it the right way? And then we get so consumed with thinking about are we doing it the right way? We stop practicing and get worried and we practice less and less and then finally maybe we'll go and we'll ask a monk or ask a nun, you know, or a teacher, what am I doing wrong? Why am I not progressing? Can you help me? Can you show me what I need to do? But this getting involved with this uh, doubt of how things are working is another way uh, Mara bites us, or we say in English, the devil comes and gets us, okay? He preoccupies us with worry, 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 so we don't get anything done. Now, these, these uh, five hindrances can affect us, not just in meditation, and this is one of the reasons that I am a strong proponent for teaching the precepts and teaching the hindrances together so that young people understand when things go wrong in life, maybe I should check what's going on with my precepts because this is what's happening. I'm getting all consumed these, this way. So I'm going to say once again these, pre, these, pre, these uh, hindrances, uh, the, the lust and greed, the I wanted mind, the attachment, the second is the hatred, the aversion, the I don't want it mind, and this aversion that you get involved in. And then the third one was the um, sloth and the torpor, the tiredness and uh, the energy falling away from us so we can't get our work done, we can't stay with our task because we're so worn out from this wrong thinking different ways like this. And then the restlessness and the guilt and remorse over something when we've broken a precept. What can we do with that? What should we do is we should back up and take the precept again. Now, taking precepts this is an important part to understand because uh, taking precepts is not just something. We need to run to the temple, take the precepts. We have to have a monastic to take the precepts. No, that's not real. You can go to the ceremony and take the precepts, but you need to repeat the precepts in the morning to yourself. Say the precepts in the morning. Reinforce the precepts for each day. This should be a ritual that you personally do to keep you on the straight path. And when you celebrate the moon, ceremonies, uh, if you do this four times a month, if you do this ceremony, uh, with this is very, very supportive for you. These kinds of ceremonies are very important. What did the Buddha mean when he was talking about uh, not doing ritual? This is an important thing to understand, I think. The uh, Buddha never said no ritual at all. He was very interesting on this point. I used to ask um, uh, people when I went to visit temples in the United States, when I left, I'd get in the car to go away. I'd say, why is that Ganesh in that temple? Why is this over here in this temple? Why is this here? Why is Kuan Yin here? Why is this happening? Well, the Buddha never said these other, uh, these other gods could not be, these other deities could not be respected. They couldn't be uh, 
um, you know, worshipped as well. This was not any problem for him. What he stated in reference to other systems of worship or ceremony or ritual was do not do ritual, do not do things, the ritualistic type of things and worship with the intention of reaching Nibbana. This is the important key to understanding what was going on there. He did not advocate that you should perform ritual in order to get to Nibbana. He said, Nibbana is the here inside of you to discover for yourself. This experience, the, um, the empty, emptying out of the past, the emptying out of the future, and the caressing of the present moment for the present moment. Living life and being fully alive in what you're doing in the present moment and then letting it go. This is what the Buddha was advocating. And that eventually you would not be consumed any longer by the past or by the future biting at you. You would have be able to live in this very, very nice, comfortable present moment, moving along. Now, let me tell you a story. There was a woman who was in uh, Europe who was following uh, one tradition, and the uh, teacher told this person, you know, in order to be a good Buddhist, you have to stop painting. And then the other woman said, uh, I'm a musician. What do you have to stop playing the cello? Well, it gives you pause to hear this message is being given to someone when this person was a concert-level cellist who had played in symphony orchestras and is being asked to throw the gift away. Was this exactly what the Buddha was intending? Was this what they were, Buddha was intending for the painter? No, I think, I think this is not uh, exactly what was meant to happen. The misunderstanding could be on the part of the Westerner from what was being explained, and it could have been lost in translation. But we had to spend some time with these two people to straighten them out on what was real. You see, the issue for the Buddha was not the fact that you were playing the cello or that you were painting the portrait and putting your full being into the painting. It's extraordinary to see what a painter can paint. It's extraordinary to see what a, a cellist could play with a cello. They weren't to be throwing these gifts away. The key was the craving and the clinging that was involved in these gifts. This is what the Buddha was trying to get people to stop. Look at the obsession with a gift that you do have. If you are um, a vocalist, if you are an artist, if you are a painter, by all means, continue to sing, continue to paint, continue to make music for life. However, do not let these things completely and utterly consume your life. This is what the Buddhist message was. When you create a piece of art, you put into yourself, into creating this piece of art, and then when it's finished, that peasant moment is gone and you embrace the understanding of Anicca. And this present moment has passed, and now we move on. We can have a beautiful memory, but we don't want to hold on to the emotion that was involved in the memory. We can hold on to, uh, to um, the memory of people who were here, people who are gone, and eventually be very comfortable with that after a period of grief has uh, gone by. Now, grief is a very uh, interesting subject because um, this is part of the what happens to us when someone passes away. We examine the principles behind grief and what is involved in this. I know when I came into Buddhism initially, there were five people in my family who had died in about a 10-month period. 
that was um, very devastating to me. It was probably about nine to ten months long that these people had died, and it was very devastating to me that this, this had all happened so suddenly. And the grief I did not understand, and I got very sick with the grief, and I carried it very close to me, and it consumed me. It hurt my heart, and it hurt my stomach, and it, you know, it made me uh, just sort of shut down in my mind, and I couldn't work at all. It was a devastating experience. But what is grief? What exactly is it, and how is it happening? When I sit quietly, I wasn't asking for the thoughts to come up that drove the depression and the sadness in the situation of arising grief. But there was a cause for this grief to be there, an honest cause for the arising of the grief to come up. And certainly tears flow when we lose someone. No one should ever, ever, ever tell you, don't cry when someone has passed away or a teacher has gone and this kind of thing unless we are completely developed and enlightened and balanced no one should ever ever tell the person don't cry it's all right why because i have holes in my eyes <laughs> that's why i have tear ducts and obviously these are pressure valves in my eyes meant for tears to flow and certainly these tears need to flow in order to be relieved when someone does pass away that's close to us. So, but what is the danger of this grief? What, what happens when the grief consumes us and we do not understand the basis of what is happening in the cycle that is causing this tremendous amount of suffering on us? It's me, personally. I miss this person. I want this person back. I need the person back. I cannot live without this person being here. This is me. I need my mind coming out. It is the personalizing of what is the happening in the experience that I can control and look at how this is essentially happening instead of unessentially happening. What do I mean by that? Any, the Buddha said in the Dhammapada there were verses about to see what is essential as being essential, uh, to see what is unessential as being unessential, and to understand, to essentially see what's in the unessential, and not to get involved with the unessential that's in the essential. It was a twisted little verse. But when you say it so many times, you begin to have it sink in. I'm supposed to see things as they actually are. I'm supposed to hear things as they actually are. And we can take the event of someone passing and say, this is what happened, and the person isn't there anymore. The grief will arise, the sadness, and yes, tears will flow. But I do not have to get personally involved in this event when I say that is that I don't need to carry it with me, the devastation of the emotional stress and strain into the present moment. I can let it go. Why, why can I let it go? How should I be able to let it go? Is because of Anicca. Anicca is this impermanence, and we said that the impermanence is what makes us suffer, the dissatisfaction with the impermanence. But when someone passes away, this, uh, we know that the grief will arise. All feeling of any kind and sensation will arise, will be there, and will pass away. So we have a safety point in this knowledge. It will come, it will arise, and be there, and it will pass away. It will come in cycles, and it will do this for a period of time. We also have the practice I've been teaching you of right effort. And when this tendency, this unwholesome tendency comes up that causes a pressure or tension and tightness, if we release that and relax and lightly smile, just a little bit of a smile, it's not a big toothy smile, we're not at the carnival, we're just talking about lightly smiling. I know this, you say to yourself, this is arising, this is here, 
This is passing away. So when we practice this way and we let it go and just be there, we don't try to make it stop. Because why? Because it belongs there. Because this is the truth. Because we cannot fight with the truth. The truth of the present moment, when it happens, is there. We cannot change the truth. And so what we do is we notice the arising tension and tightness. And then we release it. We relax and smile. And then we come back to what it is that we're doing in life. Now, what is the object of meditation when we're in life? How can I say that meditation is life and life is meditation? Is that meditation is here all the time. And it is process that we can carry this right effort from one place into the next place, and we can do it all the time. So if I'm sitting, if I'm able to sit quietly in a chair on a couch, it doesn't have to be in the floor. You know, I actually knocked on the floor once, and nobody was there. <laughs> nobody came out and said, Oh, I'm glad you asked. It's important you sit on the floor because the secret to enlightenment is right here in the floor. And guess what? It's not there. <laughs> so it's important for the Westerner to understand you don't have to sit on the floor. The important part of sitting in meditation was sitting absolutely still. The importance of the Buddha statue in front of you, if you have one, was you can move as much as the Buddha statue moves. That's how much you can move. Don't move at all. That's how we do the meditation. Then when we're not moving physically with our body and there's no sensation at all with body, we have closed our eyes. We have allowed sounds to just be sounds, nothing more odors, taste, not any comment on them, body, sitting still, not moving. What's left? What's left is your mind. And Buddha was doing a mind yoga. So this is what he was doing. He was observing the mind, movement of mind's attention. How does it move without you telling it to move? What does it do? What happens? comes up, it's there, it passes away. You don't need to go and look at it. You don't need to know anything about what comes up. You didn't ask for it. You didn't order it. You can stay with what you're doing in the present moment or with whatever your object of meditation is. So I'm going to leave you now, and I'm going to let you go, and I will be back shortly, and we will do a little bit more work with the meditation, I hope that I've brought into focus a little bit about the precepts and the hindrances and how they can affect you in life as well as in your meditation. And we'll be back.